This video is part of the Systems and Proof module in Foundations of Computer Science. I will be walking through another proof by strong induction of a property of a post system. As I mentioned when I introduced this system earlier, it represents a classic strong induction problem that is sometimes referred to as the postage stamp problem. It also happens to be an example of a post system that has multiple axioms. And so recall the two axioms are that four is in the set P and five is in the set P. And then we have one rule we call R where it says X is in P and Y is in P implies X plus Y is in P. So that is the system and the claim is that if we think of our axioms as telling us that we have four cent and five cent stamps available and we think of rule R as saying you can combine any number of those stamps together as many times as you like, we could then represent any amount of postage greater than or equal to 12 cents. Of course, this is also a claim about what kinds of positive integers are in our set P, and we can prove it by showing that every positive integer greater than or equal to 12 is in the set P. So that's what we're going to do, and just note that this is a completeness result because we're showing that all positive integers greater than or equal to 12 belong to P, but not that only positive integers greater than or equal to 12 belong to P. That would be a soundness result. And in fact, we cannot show that because it's not true. We can see right away we have four and five are in P and they are not greater than or equal to 12. I point this out because we used strong induction to prove a soundness result last time and we're using it to prove a completeness result this time. And sometimes when people are starting out with these different types of inductive proofs, they get to thinking that maybe strong induction always goes with soundness and weak always goes with completeness or something. And so part of the reason for mixing it up is to emphasize that no, that is not true. There is not like an automatic correlation between strongness and soundness or, or anything like that. Uh, your choice of strong or weak or other type of induction depends on the structure of the definition that you're looking at and what you're trying to prove. So as with our previous examples, we will begin by rewriting our claim as a parameterized statement, S of n. And what we come up with is if n is a positive integer such that n is greater than or equal to 12, then n is in the set P. And again, note, that is equivalent to saying that all positive integers greater than or equal to 12 are in P, but we've now broken out this parameter N, which we will use to organize our proof. So in keeping with our previous examples, I will now give you a formal expression of the outline of this argument, and we'll talk through what it means. So first, I have four base cases. I have S of 12, 13, 14, and 15, and I'm going to have to show all four of those. Then I have my inductive step and my inductive hypothesis, right? That says for all n greater than or equal to 15, uh, if it is the case that S of 12, 13, 14, and 15, all these base cases hold, and then also everything up to n, then I can also prove S of n plus one. So if this assumption holds, then this conclusion holds. And that is what I need to prove in my inductive step. And if I prove both the base cases on line one here, and then this statement on line two, then I will have completed my proof, which is to say, I will have shown that for all n greater than or equal to 12, S of n holds. This is a preview of what we're going to do, but I want to make very clear that the reason I can give you this preview is that I already know what the proof is going to say. So if you were just given this problem without any further guidance, I don't want to give you the impression that you would be expected to begin with this outline. What is more likely is that you would start by trying some argument and seeing whether you ran into trouble. And then if you did, going back and trying something else or fixing it up and eventually settling on something that worked. In this case, since I'm walking you through the proof, that has all already happened. So I give you this preview in hopes of making the argument easier to follow 
But again, don't think that you should just somehow be able to look at the post system and automatically know that you're going to need four base cases. That is something that depends on what you're arguing and how you decide to argue it. All right, so as in our previous examples, let's start by translating this large, dense, symbolic statement into something a little bit closer to natural language English. We'll start by saying we want to establish our basis, and that means we're showing S holds for 12, 13, 14, and 15. And then we have our inductive hypothesis. That's where we assume that our statement is true from S of 12 up to N, where N is greater than or equal to 15. And notice that's the same as the statement here, but I've just written out more of the values. Then to prove the inductive step, we just need to show as always that S of N plus one is true, assuming the inductive hypothesis. That completes the outline of the proof. Let's move on to look at the details, starting with the base cases. So as we said, there are four cases and we have to show that our statement holds for N equals 12, 13, 14, and 15. So we'll do these one by one. And for the first case, we just need to show that 12 is in the set P. The way we do this is simply by deriving it using the rules of the post system. To derive 12, we start with two applications of rule B1, which just says that the number four is in the set P. Then we use our rule R to say that that means that four plus four is also in the set P. And we go back and use rule B1 another time to get another four. And then finally, we use rule R a second time to show that four plus four plus four is in the set P, and therefore we've shown that 12 is in P. So now moving on to 13, fortunately this case is very similar. We just replace one of our applications of rule B1 with an application of rule B2, which says five is in the set P. And so in total, we end up with two applications of rule B1, one application of rule B2, and two applications of rule R. And of course, since this shows that four plus four plus five is in the set, we've shown that 13 is in the set. So by now, the rest of our strategy is probably obvious. We can modify this derivation to show that 14 is in our set by replacing one more application of rule B1 with an application of rule B2. And then we just repeat that process one more time to show that 15 is also in the set. That establishes our base case, and all we have left to do is prove the inductive step. In this step, as usual, we get to assume the inductive hypothesis, which means we're assuming that our statement holds for some arbitrary n greater than or equal to 15 here. And since it's strong induction, we also get to assume that this statement is true for every value up to and including that n, uh, starting from our first base case, which was 12. And also, as usual, to complete the inductive step, we need to show that our claim holds for n plus 1. And that means that n plus 1 is in the set P as long as n is greater than or equal to 15. Very generally speaking, our strategy for inductive proofs is to try to rewrite our claim in terms of some smaller value uh, for which our inductive hypothesis applies so we can actually use it. And so that's what we're going to do here. Just through simple arithmetic, we observe that if n is greater than or equal to 15, uh, we can then conclude also that n plus 1 minus 4 must be greater than or equal to 12. And there's nothing particularly special going on here. We're just saying if n is greater than or equal to 15, then n plus 1 is greater than or equal to 16, and then minus 4, right? Just arithmetic is all that's happening. And of course, n plus 1 minus 4 simplifies just to n minus 3. Now, that might seem like kind of a random thing to do, like why would we just subtract 4? But again, the point is to try to find some element where we can use our inductive hypothesis. And since we've just shown that n minus 3 is greater than or equal to 12, that means the inductive hypothesis applies because we have now a k that is greater than or equal to 12, and it's less than or equal to whatever our n is. So now we could say, aha, we have this element that is in p. It's n minus 3. And we got to it, remember, just by subtracting 4. That number is of particular interest because of the way our post system is defined. In particular, 
4 is a good choice because we have an axiom, B1, that says 4 is in the set P. And if you recall, we also have a rule that says if we have two elements that are both in the set P, their sum is in the set P. And since n minus 3 plus 4 is the same thing as n plus 1, that really takes us to the end of our proof. To write it out, we just say by rule r, n minus 3 plus 4 is in P, and that is the same as saying n plus 1 is in P, which is what we were trying to show. So if you want, you could add like a little square or something to indicate that we are done. Now that said, at the risk of maybe belaboring this point a little, I just want to emphasize that what we did here was simply walk through a completed proof so that you could see the reasoning that takes us from one step to another and get a sense of what the overall structure of this would look like when it is finished. What we did not do, on the other hand, is answer a very reasonable question that you might have, which is, how would you generate this proof if you were just given this problem? So the first thing I should say about that probably is that generating proofs in general is difficult, at least for most people. And it usually involves at least some amount of trial and error. At the same time, hopefully it's not pure trial and error. And so in this case, we began with this intuition that's based on the fact that we have a system where we know that we can always generate a new element by adding four to any element that we have already. So the idea that the proof is based on is the realization that if we can always add four, all we have to do is show that there are four consecutive elements somewhere, and then that we could generate every other element we need simply by adding four repeatedly to one of those initial elements. And realizing that is what motivates the decision to have four base cases. Also, when we get to the inductive step, we know that our n has to be out here somewhere. And this intuitive view then suggests that a reasonable thing to do is to walk back four steps and use the inductive hypothesis on the element that we end up at and then add four again to get back to the element that we're trying to prove is actually in the set. Okay, so now obviously this still does not give you a complete procedure for generating the proof, and in general there is no such procedure, but hopefully it at least gives you some idea of the thought process behind this result. So that concludes our example of a proof by strong induction for the postage stamp problem. In the next video, we will look at a proof by mutual induction of a property of rooted trees. 